Let's go ahead and um, stand up and go before the Lord in prayer. And as we worship, you can be seated as you like. <coughs> Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you that we can come here and worship you. Lord, I pray that uh, we would give you our focus and our attention. Lord, as um, we come to honor you, Lord, I pray that you would be um, moving in this place and that you would meet us here. In Jesus' name. Never 
comes out on me. Your love never fails and never gives up, never runs out on me. Your love never fails and never gives up, never runs out on me. Your love.
find strength to face the day. And in your presence, all I Lord, to have your way, to do what you want, to do what you please, Lord, that um, we would trust and know, Lord, that what you have is far better, Lord, than our desires, Lord, that what you have is far better than what we could um, make up on our own or try to figure out, Lord, you have what's best. And so I pray, Lord, that we would trust you and obey you, and I pray that you be glorified and honored in our lives, in Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, ladies. So nice to see you. I am going to kind of have to stand on my tippy toes because I'm short and I feel like I'm looking at <laughs> these two flowers. This is great. I love these flowers. 
Today we're going to be in Hebrews chapter 11, verses 8 to 16. Um, my name is Becky Pierce, for those of you that don't know me. Our announcements are tomorrow, prayer from 10 to 11. Um, I hope you would join us one hour for women only. And then, of course, you can pick these up to invite friends. It's not too late. They can come in anytime. Also, just a reminder, we have a sign-up in the back for um, if you're willing to be called into the nursery if they have more than, I think it's six kids, Talia might need help. So it isn't to sign up on a regular basis, but just when help is needed. And that is it for announcements. So turning to Hebrews chapter 11, and I'd like to pray. Father God, we just come to you in the name of Jesus and ask, Lord, that you just um, fill us, anoint us afresh with your spirit, Father, as we prepare to um, dig into your word, to read your words, Father. Just speak to hearts what you want us to hear. Give heart, us hearts to receive it, Father. I pray that you help me to present your word as you would want it to be presented. We love you, Jesus. Amen. Okay, so Hebrews 11, we're going to start off with reading verses 8 to 10. By faith. Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out, not knowing where he was going. By faith, he dwelt in the land of promise, as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. We know Abraham is extolled in scriptures as the father of all who believe. Romans 4, 11 tells us that. Hold on. I had to take off my cough drop. <laughs> okay. In the Bible, Abraham is presented to us as a great example of a man who lived by faith. James 2, 23 records, And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, And Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. Abraham, the father of faith, the friend of God. We know that Hebrews was written to the Jewish Christians to admonish them to walk in the greater ways of Jesus Christ, their high priest, to keep the faith even in the times of persecution and trials. And now he gives us these saints to that remember these faithful saints of God as an example. And for those very reasons, this book of Hebrews is so very good for us. How much more do we need to be reminded to stand strong, stand firm in our faith in these days? So it goes, by faith, Abraham obeyed. Abraham was not a Jew. He was called, um, when he was called, he was a pagan. He came from an idol-worshipping um, country in Ur of the Chaldeans. And we've been fortunate enough to be in um, Genesis. And I know Mark talked about all of this back, I think it was like in the end of December and December. God, for his reason, chooses Abraham. And verse 8 says, Abraham was called by God, and he obeyed when he was called to go. So Abraham, he left a country that really had a lot of luxuries for its days, um, and he leaves that, not knowing where he's going. But God called him, he obeys, he's trusting God. His departure from Ur was an example of faith in action. Our actions must be in harmony with what we believe. That is so important to remember. Our actions must be in harmony with what we believe, right? We need to walk the talk. In Genesis 12, 
1 to 4, the Lord told Abraham, leave your country, your family, go to a land I will show you, and then the promise. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. I'll make your name great. You shall be a blessing. I'll bless those who bless you. I'll curse those who curse you. And in you, all families of the earth shall be blessed. This was the promise of the Messiah that was to come from Abraham's lineage. Actually, Abraham, we know that because we have been studying it, was not fully obedient when he was called to get out of your country and, and from your family. Abraham didn't leave his father, his family, nor did he leave the land completely at first. Yet here in verse 8, this uh, doesn't mention any of those shortcomings of following God's command. It's not mentioned. Abraham's faith was less than perfect, Yet thousands of years later, God does not mention his delayed obedience, only the faith. And don't you just love that? You just have to love that. Abraham was not totally perfect. Neither are we. <laughs> Far from it. Yet God uses yielded vessels, not perfect vessels. And thank you, Jesus, for that. These promises were not predicated on Abraham's goodness, but on God's grace. It was totally by God's grace. It was by God's grace that he called Abraham, and it's by God's grace that we are called. It's by God's grace that he blesses us, not by anything that we do or deserve or own, but by his grace that we receive and experience the blessings of God. Don't feel like you have to earn them. Don't let yourself get in a self-pity that I'm not good enough. None of us are good enough. It's simply by God's grace. The nation of Israel began with the call of Abraham from Ur of the Chaldeans. God promised Abraham and Sarah a son. Um, they had to wait 25 years for the fulfillment. I think most of us know that. We know the story of Abraham and Sarah and their lack of faith trying to help God, and that's never a good thing. The birth of Ishmael from Hagar, Sarah's handmaiden. But God always keeps his promise. He promised them a son. Sarah bears a son, Isaac. Isaac, the father of Jacob. It was Jacob, the nation, came forth by the birth of his 12 sons. Joseph, that saved the nation in the land of Egypt. And Moses, who would later deliver them from Egypt. These are all spoken of, and you will be getting to hear those later. Abraham's name is great to the Jews, Muslim, and Christians, just as God said he would promise to make his name great. Verse 9 says, by faith he dwelt. The Greek meaning describing one who lives at a certain place but doesn't have permanent status there. Abraham lived as a sojourner in the land God promised, never owning any of it except where him and Sarah were buried. Because they had no permanent home, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob lived in tents instead of homes. But it tells us they looked forward to a better city. The city, verse 10 said, which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. As us born-again Christians, we too are sojourners on this planet Earth. We must always remember that. This is not our home. We're on a pilgrimage. This is not our home. Okay, verses 11 to 12. By faith, Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed, and she bore a child when she was past the age, because she judged him faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one man and him as good as dead, were born as many as the stars of the sky in multitude, innumerable as the sand which is by the seashore. I love that. In, in Genesis, or one, it says it, it says also like the dust. I mean, you can't count them. <laughs> Genesis 17.5, by faith, Sarah says, so Genesis 17.5, God tells Abram, 
your name shall no longer be Abram, but Abraham, literally father of a multitude. For I have made you a father of many nations. And then in Genesis 17, 15, uh, then God said to Abram, as for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah. And this is so interesting, and maybe some of you know this, but this is interesting um, about this change of name. When God changed Abram's name, he inserted the Hebrew letter H into the name of Abram. The Hebrew letter H is made with the sound of breath. God put the sound of breath into his name, or rather inserted himself, because the Hebrew word, and oh, I wish I could pronounce it correctly, the Hebrew word ruhach, or something like that, we're hearing that, ruhach, that Hebrew word, which is breath, is a word for spirit. So God inserted the spirit into the name of Abram, changing it to Abraham. I love that. That's beautiful. In changing the name of Abram's wife, Sarai, God did the very same thing for her. Abram means high father. Abraham means father of many nations. Sarai means contentious. And Sarah means princess. So she got a much better meaning for her name. <laughs> Thus, the insertion of God's spirit or God's life into Abraham and Sarah, bringing them into a new dimension of life the life after the spirit. I love that, what that letter H meant. In Genesis 18, 1, this is a story we know when the three men are coming to Abraham's tent to tell them what's going to happen to Sodom and Gomorrah. So it says that they appear to Abraham as he was sitting in the tent, and he sees these three men approaching. So he runs up to meet him, and it says he bows before them, which is the Hebrew word meaning worship. So he must have known these men were, were someone special. And, and he says, you know, stay and I'll, I'll give you water for your, uh, wash your feet, I'll have food to be refreshed. I love this part. He says that you may refresh your hearts. So the, they said yes. And, and, and then they said to Abraham, where is Sarah, your wife? And he said, here in the tent. Now these three men, two of them are angels. And it said that one of them was the Lord Jesus, Christophany. Um, that's a visible manifestation of Jesus in the Old Testament. So he said to Abraham, Sarah, your wife, and we know the story, but I love it. Sarah, your wife, shall have a son. And Sarah was listening in the tent door, which was behind them. And for some reason, that just makes me smile. Because that's just like us women, I think. I mean, if three men come to my house, and my husband opens the door, and, come, you know, I might be listening in the hallway. What do they want? What are they doing here? And that's what Sarah was doing. And, and Sarah hears a man say, Sarah will have a son. And Sarah, of course, you know, at her age, thinking, no way, not at my age. And she laughs within herself, not out loud. She laughs within herself. And the Lord heard her inaudible laugh. And the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh? Saying, I shall, shall I surely bear a son since I am old? And Sarah said, I did not laugh. And he said, no, but you laughed. And I thought, oh, my, you know, maybe Sarah thinking, well, I didn't laugh out loud, so maybe he didn't hear me. But I thought it was interesting that Sarah laughed within herself. She didn't laugh out loud. And yet God heard it and knew the reason for her laugh without her saying a thing. I like that because the Lord so knows our hearts and thoughts. We don't have to say them. He knows. He knows them even before we think them. It tells us in Psalms 139. I say take comfort in that. God knows your heart. He knows those things that you haven't shared with anyone else. God knows your heart. And he loves you. He created you. If you're hurting, spend time with him. Tell him. He already knows. He has words for you. He has comfort for you. I love that. That shows how he knows our hearts. And then the Lord says to Abraham, is anything too hard for the Lord? So I ask you, ladies, is anything too hard for the Lord? No, no. 
Jesus said, the things which are impossible with men are possible with God. Hallelujah. Luke 18, 27. The things which are impossible with men are possible with God. Those are not just words. Those are truth. Take them in. Hold on to them. God did exactly what he said he would do. Sarah had a baby boy. And verse 11 says, she bore a child. She judged him faithful who had promised. The birth of Isaac was based on God's faithfulness, performing what he promised, not on Abraham or Sarah's faith. It was God's faithfulness. Verse 11 says, by faith, Sarah received strength to conceive seed. The strength, the strength came from God. It shows God does the work. God does the work. Our part is faith, to just believe his promises. God does the work. This made me think, you know, are, are some of you, now in the midst of life shattering circumstances i know myself i have been there H have you been in prayer for years for a son and daughter or daughter or grandchildren are you dealing with some serious health issues maybe mental health issues depression marriage issues not sure what's going to happen crying out to god for something you feel that is so out of your control Verse 11, it says, by faith, Sarah received strength. Take that. Remember that. By faith, we can receive and do receive the strength of God. It isn't anything we have to do on our own. Stuff comes into our lives that are just beyond our control. But it's not bigger than God. None of it is bigger than God. By faith, Sarah received strength. God is still on the throne. God is still in control. And he will give you the strength to walk through what you need to do. Or maybe not do. Maybe the strength to just wait until he tells you. In verse 12, talking about Abram, it says, Him as good as dead. In Romans 4, Paul writes, and not being weak in faith, Abraham did not consider his own body already dead and the deadness of Sarah's womb. He did not waver at the promise of God, convinced that God had, what God had promised, he was also able to perform. And then Romans 4.22 tells us, Abraham's faith was accounted to him for righteousness. That has been one of my, I just love that verse. I've held on to that verse because sometimes when you're in a dark, hard place, you feel like you can't do anything, but you can just believe. You can just believe God and who he said he is, and he'll do what he said he'll do. And God counts that unto you for righteousness. Genesis 15, 5, God said, Look, count the stars, so shall your descendants be. And Genesis 15, 6, and Abraham believed in the Lord and he accounted it to him for righteousness. That verse, Genesis 15, 6, so good. Sometimes in our darkest hours of sorrow or whatever, all we can do is just believe and hear God in God's word. It says that God will account that to us for righteousness, just to believe. This verse 12 in Hebrews tells of the fulfillment of Genesis 15, 5, because it says, From one man, good as dead, were born as the stars of the sky, in multitude, innumerable as the sand which is by the seashore. Right? We have no idea the things that God has planned for us. Sarah and Abraham, millions of descendants were born. Their faith had an impact on more lives than they could have ever dreamed of. Ladies, we have no idea how our lives lived for Christ impact others. 
I know in this room there are ladies who've walked with the Lord, have impacted others. Their families, friends, neighbors, people who will be in heaven someday, or maybe they're there now because of your lives lived for Christ. I, at one time, and I've shared this when I was going through some really hard times in my life, um, the Lord just spoke to me and told me, just believe. So I believe has been a big thing for me. And I did a little side study on uh, the word believe. The Hebrew word is amun, amun. The Greek, uh, the he, that's a Hebrew verb. The he, a Greek verb is pesibu, something like that, amun. But the first use of believe is in Genesis 15, 6, where Abraham believed Jehovah, and he counted it to him for righteousness. So the use of Amon, 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 I think, in this passage indicates that Abraham did not just give mental assent to God's promise to give Abraham descendants as many as the stars, but that Abraham relied on that promise. He made a personal commitment Abraham believed God's word of promise and relied on it. It's not enough that we know his promises. We need to know them for starters, but we also need to take them in and believe them and hold on to them. Even if things around us seem so impossible, God is a God that does not lie. He will fulfill his promises. The word amen meaning so be it, truly, it is certain. Amen is derived from this Hebrew verb amon. It is as if Abraham heard God's promise in Genesis 15, 5 and said, amen. Jesus repeatedly used the Hebrew word amen, truly or verily, to express the trustworthiness and abiding certainty of his sayings. The use of the Hebrew word Amon, Genesis 15, 6, provides the key to how a man or woman was saved in Old Testament. And that key is by grace through faith, just as it is in the New Testament. Old Testament saints were not saved by works of righteousness or by keeping the law, or by performing the prescribed sacrifices. We know that, right? That was just a covering of the sin. It never took it away. Paul quotes Genesis 15, 6, where it says Abraham believed in the Lord and he counted it to him for righteousness. He quotes it in Romans 4 and in Galatians 3. Demonstrates that this Old Testament verse is foundational for an understanding of what it means to believe God. In other words, Paul explains, Abraham believed the gospel. The gospel was preached in the Old Testament. Listen to Galatians 3, 8, and 9. It says, and the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand, saying, in you, all nations shall be blessed. So then these who are by faith are with believing Abraham. Thus, Abraham becomes the prototype for all Old Testament men and women who also were justified, declared righteous by grace through faith and the good news of the coming Messiah. That's how we're justified, right? Through faith, by grace. As to the law, Excuse me. <clears throat> as, to how, as to how much detail the Old Testament believers had in the redemptive work of the Messiah, we can only surmise. The point is, they had enough light to make a firm committal to God's promise of a coming Redeemer and to result in genuine salvation. And when I read that, I thought, for us, 
for those today, how much light have we been given? We have the Old Testament, the New Testament. We know of the prophecies fulfilled. How many promises that have been given to us? It says thousands. We've been given so much light. <clears throat> so there is no excuse not to rejoice in our salvation, no matter the circumstances surrounding us. Abraham and especially Sarah have been such an example for me. And I heard Mark speak a while back that Abraham was an example for him. <clears throat> Sarah, I, I, as a much younger mom um, with our children, Bill decided he wanted to go back to school. We were living in Northern California. So I don't think he took anything. We had a little money, and I can't believe we did this. We bought an old pickup truck with a camper on it. We're going to take off across country and see where God would lead us and he was going to work and go to school. He had an aunt in Minnesota, so we're going to go out there. So we went out there. Thank God. <laughs> the Lord brought us back to Sacramento. And um, he went to college there and, and med school. But, you know, I thought of Sarah. She, she was my example. And I, I know, you know, what was she, what did she feel like when Abraham said, we're going? You know, and I heard Jack Hibbs say the same thing. Now, Abraham had heard from the Lord, but it doesn't tell us Sarah did. So Sarah just, you know, okay, you know, we're going to just pack it up. Where are we going? I don't know where we're going. We're just going. Okay. <laughs> and so she goes. She's not sure where, but she's going to go. And I knew from the Bible she goes and that God takes care of Sarah, right? Even when her uh, husband Abraham has elapsed in faith twice, when he allows her to be taken into the Pharaoh's harem and then again allows her to go into the king's palace, but God takes care of her. I knew what 1 Peter 3 said about being submissive to our husbands, and I, I know where it says that Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, little L, trusting God. But that, this was the part that got me because 1 Peter 3, it says the holy women trusted in God. They trusted in God being in subjection unto the own husband. So that was the secret. Maybe it's hard sometimes to trust and totally be on board with our husband's decisions, but we know that we know we can trust God. And I'm not talking about being in submission to a husband who would have you do ungodly things or <clears throat> physically abusive. That's not what I'm talking about. But <clears throat> we can do what the word says. <coughs> Excuse me. We can be obedient. And God will bless us for that. And I look to Sarah as my example. I know that there's others in this room. Uh, I've heard Mark uh, about share about how they came here. There's others that have moved across country, across state, um, because of jobs. Isn't it a comfort to know that God always goes with us and promises to take care of us? Faith is believing God will work it out and keep his promises despite the circumstances. Faith is relying on what God has done rather than our own efforts. I love that. Faith is relying on what God has done rather than our own efforts. And that was the problem with these Hebrew Christians. If they truly believed Jesus' sacrifice of himself was once and for all and took away their sins, why were they thinking of going back to adding their own efforts instead of resting on the completed and finished work of the cross? Again, our actions must be in harmony with what we believe. Okay, let's read verses 13 to 16. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland, and truly, if they had called to mind that country from which they had come out, they would have had opportunity to return. But now they desire a better that is a heavenly country. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. 
also in these verses, 13 to 16, it's kind of like the writer takes a break listing the saints, and he comments on the nature of their faith. The writer makes a sweeping statement. All these, he said, died in faith without receiving the promises. Seems like the writer here decides to preach a little at this point. These words, these all died in faith, imply that faith was their dominant characteristic to the end of their days. These all died in faith. Literally, this reads, according to faith. The idea is they died in keeping with their life in faith. So they died as they lived. That is, their strong, preserving faith was a controlling characteristic of their life. Verse 13, not having received the promises, Chuck Smith said the promises of the Messiah that God had given to them. They believed in God's salvation that he promised that he would provide. They all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on earth. These verses 13 through 16 are titled in my Bible, The Heavenly Hope. And like heaven belongs to the Christian, we, those born-again believers, we've been promised heaven. God promised his eternal life with him and that we are already seated with Christ in heavenly places. It talks about that in Ephesians 2. And John 10 says, Jesus said, and I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. And by faith, we believe it. One day, every Christian will literally possess heaven and be with Christ forever. For now, we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face, face to face. By faith, we believe it. This is our heavenly hope. Verse 13 says, they received the promises. They were assured of the promises. They embraced the promises. They could say, I'm only a stranger and a pilgrim here, satisfied to dwell in a tent. We must be assured of the promises. Embrace the promises. This world is not our home. We look for the city whose builder and maker is God. We, too, are strangers and pilgrims on the earth. This is our heavenly hope. And how we need that kind of faith in this world today. Who wants this world today? Verse 15 said, They could have gone back to the homeland, but as it is, they desire a better, a better country that is a heavenly one, a city prepared by God. If we want 2020 vision to see our eternal home, and if you believe we are what we eat, then spiritually make sure you're getting a steady diet of the word of God. If you get nothing else from today, I hope you get this. Faith feeds on the word of God. That is so important. Faith feeds on the word of God. Romans 10, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. I can't emphasize this enough, that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You want to increase your faith. Do you need help with a situation? Open your Bible. God is speaking to you. Don't say that God doesn't talk to you. Open the Bible. Sit, read, listen, cry out. It is his heart to talk to you. I, and I've shared this before, but I remember in that time of just going through such hurt and talking to a friend with my Bible in my lap, and I'm talking to her on the phone, and I was so hurting, and I said, gosh, I'm just not hearing from God. You know, the devil's talking to me and putting thoughts in my head. I'm not hearing from God. And then I look down, and there on my lap was my Bible. Oh, yes, I can hear from God. Open your Bible. God wants to speak to you. Abraham and Sarah could have returned to the land they left if their hearts were still there. 
but they believed that God had a better place for them, and they were content to be strangers and pilgrims on the earth. We, those who have chosen Jesus, we have left our old world behind us, and we have become a new creation. Hallelujah. <laughs> when we accepted Jesus as our Savior, these Jewish Christians were beginning to undergo severe persecution. There was a great temptation for these Jewish Christians to return to Judaism and turn away from Christianity. And here in verse 13 and 16, the writer says, these all died in faith. They held on to their faith until their dying day. These saints listed could have gone back, but they desired a better, a heavenly country. Christians are not meant to be so comfortable in this world. This is not our world. Don't worry about being so comfortable here. We look for the city prepared by God. The writer of Hebrews is saying, remember those, these that he is talking about here, those who went before us, who stood strong in the faith. And then it says, God will not be ashamed to be called their God. I found that interesting. That verse 16, it says, therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God because they desired what God had for them. And I'm wondering, so could this indica indicate that God is ashamed that some people call him God? I wonder if it's some who supposedly preach the word of God, but they purposely add or take away from God's word. Yet they call him God. In Romans 1, it speaks of those that knew God, but did not glorify him as God. Yet, for those who die in faith, he is not ashamed to be called their God. And he tells us he has prepared a city for the believers, saved by grace through faith. Revelation 21.2 says, Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. In conclusion, God is faithful. I remember reading something that just said, sums up this world. It says, this world is hard, but God is faithful. And that's, that's true. You could sum it up like that. God is faithful. And this is the thing we can count on. Hold on to that faith in God and his promises. We are weak, but he is strong. If you're in a time of trial, right now and feeling alone, feeling weak, you're not alone. That is a lie from the devil because the Lord said he is our strength, Psalms 46. He will never leave us or forsake us. These are promises from a God that cannot lie. Man, people can lie and they do lie. People have let us down. We let people down. But God God never lets us down. He will never forsake you. He will never, ever let you down. There is a reason and a purpose for all of it. We may not see it this side of heaven. Maybe it's only in heaven that we'll get it. But you'll see that God worked it all out according to his purposes for your good and his glory. Abraham believed he regarded the God who made this promise as reliable and fully capable, making it a reality. Abraham and Sarah's belief in God is held up in Scripture as an example of saving faith. We worship the same God, the same God who never changes, and his promises are true and amen, 2 Corinthians 1. The object of Abraham's faith was not God's promise. That was the occasion of its exercise. His faith rested on God himself. God himself. That's where our faith rests. 
we can believe God's promises because we can believe and trust God to be faithful, even when we are faithless at times. Abraham left behind his citizenship papers and settled existence in Ur to trust God and travel to Canaan on the strength of nothing but God's command, God's word. We, those of us that are born again, have actually done similar. On the faith of God's word, we give up our earthly citizenship for a better, a greater. There are so many people who have given up their lives to stand firm on the gospel with their eyes on their heavenly home. A lady here commented on last week's teaching. She said, none of these saints knew what was going to happen. Only with our gracious, powerful God is there that kind of hope in the waiting and suffering. I love that. Only with our gracious, powerful God is there that kind of hope in the waiting and the suffering. And that's why I so emphasize you're going through suffering, waiting, open the word. He wants to speak to you. There is nothing or anyone who can comfort you during the dark days like Jesus can, like the Bible can. Truly, the Lord becomes our lifesaver as we might feel like we're drowning in our hurt and pain. And I know there's many of us that have felt that. But truly, God was my lifesaver. Truly, he is able and does give beauty some ashes. Only God can do that, and God does that. By faith, Abraham obeyed. God called him to go, and he obeyed not knowing where he was going. It was enough for him to know that he went with God. You don't have to know how it's going to end. You just have to have faith in God. Build up your faith. Open the word. Jesus told Martha, and how I love this, did not I say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? That's what happens during those dark times. If we just believe, we will see the glory of God. I love that. Just believe. Because faith is connected with God, impossible things happen because we have a personal God. He sees everything we go through. He is with us. God doing the impossible in our lives. The very same God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The exact same God. We live by faith. They had this promise afar off. The reality of that city. And I love what our pastor Mark said. He said, it is not what we live in, but what we live for. That's so good. It is not what we live in, but what we live for. Spurgeon said, these all had received a great deal, but they had not received the fullness of the promises. You and I have not received all the promises. We've received a great deal. But there are certain promises that we have not yet received. The coming of the glorious one, which is the brightest hope of the church, when the Lord would descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God. We've not received that yet. And heaven itself, with all its splendor, we've not yet received. We're looking for these. We die in faith, expecting that we shall enter upon the fulfillment of these promises. God said it. It will be done. I love that somebody said, at death, you won't leave home. You will go home. Faith is as precious to die by as to live by. Faith shows itself genuine by a changed life. Faith is the mark of a Christian. Abraham was saved by faith alone, but the faith that saved him showed itself to be genuine by his obedience. In Galatians 3, 7, it tells us, 
Those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. That's us. So then those who are of faith are blessed. We are blessed. Are blessed with believing Abraham. That's you, ladies, if you're born again. Faith equals blessings. You can truly trust him, even in the heartbreak. Johnny, Johnny Erickson Tata, who's someone who truly knows about heartbreak, said, God is good, not because he gives us answers, but because he gives us himself. Let's pray. Father, your word is overwhelming. I just, oh, Lord, and even just kind of with the weekend we just had celebrating your resurrection. Oh, God, truly, how do we thank you for what you did for us on that cross, Lord, that we know that even now as we come to you in the name of Jesus, you are, you are here and you are listening. Father, thank you. Thank you for all of it. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for your spirit. Oh, Father, thank you for sparing your son. Help us now, Father, to just truly live a life surrendered to you. Help us to keep our eyes on you. Help us to be faithful in the things that you would have us to do. We love you, Jesus. Amen. Kathleen will come up.